Welcome, you're watching the NWR Mining Resources Series. We're joined by South Haas Potash. South Haas Potash specializes in the development of potash mining projects. Presenting today, we have Chris Gilchrist, who is the Managing Director, all the way from Ireland. Over to you, Chris, with your presentation. Uh, good afternoon, or as I should say, good morning. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak and tell you this morning or this afternoon about South Hearts Potash. As it says, we're growing a responsible potash business in the heart of Germany. What I'm going to do is uh, show you what our assets look like, describe our plan, uh, talk about um, potash. Um, in Australia, I think you're more accustomed to potassium sulfate or SOP. So I'm going to uh, give you a very brief uh, lesson on SOP versus MOP. And uh, we'll touch on the recent exciting announcement uh, by uh, BHP and how that may or may not affect South Hearts Potash. So let's head on. First of all, a message from our lawyers, which you can read at your leisure later, I'm sure. Okay, about South Hearts Potash. Um, we have 100% owned mining licenses in the heart of Germany, uh, and these represent the largest potash resort in Western Europe. Uh, we've got a lot of potential to, uh, to grow and unlock the value of these assets uh, over a rather swift period because of the fact that we've already got the exploration data we need uh, to take this forward. Uh, we have got multi-components uh, in our potash uh, resource because not only does it contain uh, potassium chloride or MOP, but also it has uh, the uh, capacity to make SOP and other magnesium uh, type nutrients or additions additive to uh, fertilizers. We uh, are very well positioned geographically to become a dominant force uh, in Europe, uh, and we are committed to uh, having the highest of ESG standards. Clearly, this will be extremely important as we move forward. So let me tell you about those assets. And uh, before we do so, just a quick rundown of who we are. Uh, often when I hear about a new project, the first thing I do is look at the uh, who the directors and managers are. So there is myself who has got uh, experience uh, across a number of mineral suites, but uh, including potash. Uh, and I was previously managing director for Britain's only potash mine, uh, which was owned by Anglo-American and then later by Israel Chemicals. Mr. Ian Farmer, who has got long experience, uh, mostly in the platinum industry, uh, and was a CEO of uh, Lonmin, who were the world's third largest uh, platinum producer. And now we're lucky to have Ian as uh, chairman of our company. Uh, Dr. Copens, uh, Rory Luff, whom you know uh, from Melbourne, uh, BW Equities, and one of our biggest shareholders, uh, Hans Jörg Plagemars, representing. Uh, our base based in Germany, and Len Jobber, whom you may know previously as CEO of Bannerman uh, Resources, based here in uh, based in Perth, uh, is one of our directors. So moving on to Germany, uh, the South Hearts uh, is located in the heart of Germany, in the former East Germany. Uh, we have, as I said earlier, a massive 5.3 billion ton Jork resource. Uh, which contains uh, an inferred resource, by the way, containing 567 million tons of potassium oxide in the heart of Europe. We've uh, acquired three perpetual mining licenses, which are very unique. They were granted to the former German state uh, mining company under the GDR, the communist regime in East Germany, uh, back in the early 1990s. These mining licenses were granted, but the areas were never mined. And I'll show you a close-up map a little bit uh, shortly. Uh, these mining licenses have no attaching rent or royalty. So when we mine them, we don't have to pay royalties uh, to the state, which is highly unique. Um, we believe, uh, and we've done some calculations already to show that the CapEx and OpEx can potentially be low. However, we're at the inferred resource stage. We cannot uh, announce through the ASX platform uh, what calculations we have, and this is why we're going to drill uh, our areas and bring them up to measured and indicated so we can start to talk about technical and economic uh, outcomes from our studies. Uh, the infrastructure that we need is already in place. Bear in mind that the infrastructure component of a greenfield potash project can represent up to 40% of the total capex. 
Uh, and being in central Germany, uh, we have easy access to everything we need in terms of road, rail, gas, water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is a rapidly expanding potash market, and I'll touch on market later. Uh, we are showing a clear and fast track uh, path to production in one of our areas. Uh, while we continue to develop the remaining areas, um, we've got favorable uh, regional government support. We're in Turingia, which is the uh, it's got the lowest uh, GDP per capita in Germany and crying out for, um, for employment. Uh, so we've got government support in that regard. And of course, uh, we are close to key markets and the significance of that uh, I will touch on later. Just quickly in terms of the licenses themselves, first of all, <clears throat> if we see on the map the green shaded areas, uh, these represent former potash mines. East Germany was a major potash producer and exporter uh, up until about 1990. It was the principal source of foreign exchange for the communist East German state. Uh, and the light green areas represent these, uh, these mines which are now closed. And the, the black and white squares represent uh, shafts, uh, some of which are still in operation for waste disposal purposes and uh, some of which are filled in and abandoned and closed down. The areas highlighted in red are the mining license areas that we've uh, acquired, namely uh, Omgeberger, uh, Mulhausen Nora in the center and Abelieben uh, to the south. And as you can see, uh, these areas are adjacent to the former mining areas. They were extensively explored uh, as recently as the 1980s. And we have acquired, in addition to the licenses, the results of over 300 deep drill holes that were put into the ground in these license areas. So uh, the, the license areas are currently under uh, Jork and Ferd resources because uh, we used the uh, results from the historic drilling uh, from up to the 1980s. Uh, and what we need to do in each license area is drill a couple of confirmatory uh, twin drill holes in order to confirm the results of the previous exploration. And then we can elevate uh, these license areas to measured and indicated. So the value of the uh, exploration data we already have in place uh, would be in today's terms somewhere around $500 million. Uh, and what we need to do, as I said earlier, is to drill two holes in each area to bring them up to m &I. So it's basically the cheapest potash project on the planet. Just a little bit uh, more detail on each area. Omgeberger in the top left, shown in purple shading. Uh, the measured, the indicated, sorry, the inferred resource for Omgeberger uh, currently stands at uh, over 300 million tons, of which 261 million tons is sylvanite which is the ore of first choice, potassium chloride and sodium chloride together. And it contains 42 million tons of K2O, which represents about 60 million tons of saleable potash. Uh, of course, we would only extract probably not more than 50% of that uh, because of course, uh, using room and pillar mining techniques, we'd have to leave uh, at that depth about 50% in the ground. The depth, by the way, uh, at Omgeberger starts at about 450 meters. So compared with uh, Canadian potash operations, which go down to about 1,500 meters, uh, we're really reasonably shallow in global terms. At Nora Allende, we have, uh, which is uh, in this sort of top center, uh, we have 1.7 billion tons of a mixture of sylvanite and carnalite uh, and the mineral kieserite, which, which is basically magnesium sulfate. Um, there is a market for magnesium sulfate you can also add it to fertilizers as an important uh, magnesium containing uh, additive to the nutrient. And also with the combination of potash and magnesium sulfate, you can produce potassium sulfate or SOP. So there is an exciting uh, mixture of compounds in the Nora Allende area. Nora Allende has got potash intersections up to uh, 20 meters in thickness. The average thickness at Nora Allende is just over six meters. So it's a mining dream. And again, it starts at about 450 meters in depth. Mulhausen Kulstead is our biggest area. Kulstead in yellow is a, uh, an exploration permit area, but we've got, lots, we've got drilling results from Kulstead. And our intention is to bring the exploration area Kulstead into the Mulhausen Kula uh, mining license area. And that will represent 
a massive resort uh, containing about 2.7 billion tons uh, of uh, potash resorts uh, containing 250 million, sorry, 290 million tons of cake oil. Uh, just as a reminder, BHP recently announced they had a 5.3 a billion ton uh, measured and indicated resource. So we're in the same ballpark uh, as they are, albeit we are at the inferred stage at this moment, but we have scope to uh, increase uh, the size of our resource because of the relatively unexplored areas, Colstead and Graffentona. Eberleben is a high grade uh, deposit, a little bit deeper than the rest. That Eberleben starts about 850 meters, goes down to just over a thousand meters. Uh, it contains 577 million tons, mostly of sylvanite, sylvanite intersections uh, up to 20% uh, K2O, averaging 15.6 K2O, and contains uh, close to 70 million tons of K2O. So basically, there's plenty of potash uh, in this uh, area. Uh, the mines were closed uh, during uh, German Recon, uh, when the two Germanys came together in the early 1990s. Uh, the mines were overstaffed, uh, they were undercapitalized, uh, and at the time the potash price was pretty low, it was about $100 per ton. Uh, the, the mines were offered for sale, however, there were no takers. The mining licenses for the explored areas uh, were kept uh, in, Brazil, uh, in uh, Berlin uh, by a German unit set up by the government to dispose of former East German industrial assets. Uh, the mining licenses were never sold on until we made inquiries uh, some three years ago, and uh, we were fortunate enough to acquire the licenses and the results from the exploration programs. So rather a bit of a coup uh, for our company in that respect. Very quickly, uh, the, I think the Australian audience particularly has been fed on a diet of SOP, uh, and there are nine uh, SOP, potential SOP projects uh, in Australia. Uh, and um, we are <clears throat> targeting MLP, uh, which is also potash. It's uh, a much uh, more important source of potash in the global sense. Uh, and I thought I would just say a few words about the difference between the two. Uh, firstly, MLP, uh, which is what we are focused on, is potassium chloride and contains an equivalent 60% uh, K2O. The fertilizer chemists like to express everything in K2O terms. Uh, the global market is about 70 million tons, and it's used for chloride uh, tolerant crops, uh, which represent the big ones as far as the planet is concerned. Hence, soya beans, rice, wheat, barley, all the huge big crops, uh, they are tolerant of MOP, and that's why the MOP market is 70 million tons. It's easy to mine, the processing is simple. Uh, current price is uh, enjoying a, a bit of a high, about $400. Per ton, and it's estimated or it's forecast uh, to rise to over five hundred dollars next year. However, the long-term price is, is uh, going to come back to about three hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, ranges of OPEX uh, for different producers across the planet uh, range from about one hundred and twenty dollars to about two hundred dollars per ton. SOP, which is potassium sulfate. It uh, contains a slightly lower uh, potassium content. It's a 52% equivalent K2O. Uh, it uh, represents a niche market of about 6 million tons per annum, and it's used for chloride-sensitive crops, uh, particularly in arid areas where rainfall doesn't wash the chlorides away, and it's used for uh, tobacco, uh, various fruits and vegetables, oranges, dragon fruits, various special niche-type uh, things. Uh, market is dominated by China, uh, both uh, sources from Brine Lakes, uh, as in Australia, but also the Mannheim process, which is a match manufacturing process uh, to produce SOP from MOP using sulfuric acid. Uh, the brine chemistry for uh, particularly the evaporative methods for producing SOP are quite uh, complex. And it involves a controlled uh, statewide uh, evaporations in multiple pond layouts. Uh, uh, the current price uh, is, is higher than MOP. Uh, the US dollar price uh, is uh, currently uh, looking at about $783 per ton in uh, California, for example. Uh, Northern Europe, perhaps a little bit less. The forecasts, however, for the longer term, is slightly lower. 
uh, according to Argus Media, 627. But it does enjoy a premium over MOP. Historically, that premium has been $100. However, uh, for the last few years, a premium in excess of $200 uh, has been maintained. And it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens when new players come on board. Uh, will that upset the price? Will there be uh, will there be a flood of SOP into what's a very small and sensitive market? And so the market dynamics uh, will be interesting to see if newcomers disrupt that price. Moving on to our Omgeberger project, this is our selected starter project. Uh, the reasons uh, basically simply are that it's uh, relatively shallow. Uh, we've got high grade silvernite uh, in the project area. Uh, uh, it's close to uh, derelict industrial land, which we believe would be easily permitted for uh, use. Uh, it's uh, suitable for fast track implementation of century, and uh, we are focusing a project based on approximately a million tons uh, of output. Um, we need to drill two holes into the potash sequence. In order to go right through the sequence and into the basement below the potash, uh, we're going to drill uh, two holes, uh, one later this year, one probably creep into the new year, as we previously announced. Uh, we have uh, it's a specialized drilling. Uh, it needs a large derrick to support uh, the casing weight. The hole has to be cased the whole way down uh, to prevent any water from, uh, we have to go through an aquifer and we don't want the water to go into the, uh, the potash, otherwise we'll dissolve the core. Uh, it's expensive. The cost of the drill pad and the drilling is, uh, is over 2 million Australian dollars per hole. Uh, the uh, landowner permissions were secured this year against a very difficult uh, situation where it was difficult to reach landowners and tenant farmers uh, because of COVID and it was difficult to engage with them on a face-to-face -face, uh, basis. However, uh, we're all ready to drill and uh, currently uh, we're expecting the issue of the drilling permit, which we believe is uh, imminent. After we've got the drilling and the resource upgrade in early 22, uh, we will release a technical uh, and economic scoping study uh, so that we can finally show everybody the true value of, of that asset. So this is the picture of Omgeberger and the dots on the map uh, labeled one and two show where we're going to drill. And as I said earlier, we've, uh, we've uh, obtained landowner permissions and we've uh, conducted the uh, drilling preparations and the drilling contract uh, is uh, ready for signature. Uh, we are just waiting for the permit and we will mobilize the drillers uh, early next month, uh, complete the drilling by February next year and issue the scoping study. So pretty simple uh, program and we're confident uh, that this program can be achieved on time. Once we've uh, done this, we will then launch into a feasibility study. I'm uh, expecting that the results from the scoping study, which will be done with more rigor than the normal scoping study, uh, we're going to include a market analysis uh, uh, analysis of the environmental and social issues. It'd be quite a detailed scoping study, uh, and I'm hopeful that we can take the leap to feasibility study uh, once we've got those results. But that's a decision uh, for the board to make at that stage. Uh, very quickly on permitting, we don't see any huge uh, hurdles in terms of permitting. As I said earlier, we've got very supportive government. We conducted a media and social campaign with newspaper articles, TV interviews, et cetera, in the region. And we've got many friends in the region who would like to see mining resurrected there. We've selected industrial wasteland uh, for the uh, building of our process plant and set, et cetera. So to, to get permitting, it goes down the, the, the path which we would normally expect. And that is to conduct an ESIA, to conduct the feasibility study, uh, and to submit this to the uh, regional permitting authority, the TLUBN. Uh, thereafter, they are a series of public meetings. Uh, we make adjustments to the uh, operating plan and then we get our permits. So nothing particularly onerous there. And I think already with the mining permits in place, we've got a head start uh, on that process and we enjoy good relations with the permitting authority and other uh, regional politicians. So, we, we've got all these assets. We're going to um, spearhead the Omberger project, but we have got three other potential projects. Uh, and like taxis leaving the rank one by one, uh, we plan to start to uh, unveil the true value of our other projects 
uh, as we uh, go forward, and we are currently uh, putting plans in place uh, for the board's approval to actually start to fast track the development of the other projects and to unveil their true value uh, as well. So watch this space for lots of good news from our part Potash. But quickly on market dynamics, I'm mindful of the time, uh, but market dynamics couldn't be better as we stand at the moment. Uh, the potash demand is growing at 3% per annum, massively in Brazil, uh, slightly less in China, but nevertheless growing uh, very much uh, in China. The potash price, uh, as you can see, has enjoyed a very significant upturn after the downturn uh, through the COVID years. Uh, there are fears for food security in the post-COVID uh, era. Uh, crop indices, soya, wheat, et cetera, are all up about 70%. So you will see increased prices in due course for uh, products in the shops. Uh, and the potash price has uh, come up very steeply indeed and will remain uh, in that upward cycle for some time to come. So with that rising tide, it's an excellent time to be developing a potash project. Will BHP's plans compromise South Hearts Potash in Europe? The answer is no. Uh, as you know, they're investing 5.3 billion in the Janssen project to deliver 4.35 million tons of potash by 2033, by which time the global market will have increased from 70 to 88 million tons, according to Argus Media. Uh, their plans, according to BHP's latest presentations, do not include marketing to Europe at this stage. And as you can see from the graph here, uh, the BHP market share on a global uh, basis by 2033, when they reach full production, will still be very small indeed. Uh, therefore, uh, we welcome BHP's announcement. They've, been, they've started to say things we've been saying for a long time. Obviously, more people listen when BHP say it than when SHP say it. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we're delighted uh, that they're coming into the market. They are certainly promoting potash. They're supporting potash projects for the same reasons we are, uh, and uh, they don't intend to bring potash into Europe. Part of the reason for that is, of course, the, uh, as you can see here, it's going to cost potentially at the moment freight prices from Vancouver to Europe would be somewhere of the order of $90 per ton or more. Uh, it's a 19,000 kilometer journey. Uh, notwithstanding the fact they also have a 2,000 kilometer rail journey. So the cost of transportation of Canadian potash into Europe is excessively high. And more importantly, as we go forward, the carbon cost associated with that import uh, is uh, potentially huge. And some calculations uh, using some published indices uh, show that uh, to bring potash from Saskatchewan, for example, into Europe would be associated with about 280 kilograms of CO2 per tonne. Uh, whereas uh, the, the Russians, 63, and South Park Potash would average about eight kilograms to bring potash from the center of Germany uh, into the French market. That was our baseline. Our baseline. Um, Europe is declining as a potash producer. Presently, there's more than a two million ton gap between production and demand, and that gap will grow as we go forward. Uh, and therefore, we don't see too many difficulties in, uh, because of our logistic advantages and our carbon advantage in bringing initially 1 million tons of potash into the European market uh, during this decade. We don't see difficulties with that regard. And we will, in our scoping study, we will discuss the marketing element uh, of our potash production. Why South Hearts Potash? Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of our corporate vision, which is shared uh, by our board, uh, we intend to embrace the highest of ESG standards, and we are shortly going to kick off uh, the construction of an ESG uh, management system. We have an ESG policy already, which is on our website. Uh, we intend to become the European supplier of choice, uh, and we will, of course, uh, do everything that the stakeholders and the shareholders uh, demand of us with respect for the environment, integrity of uh, our transactions, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, why are we a compelling investment case? We've got a tier one asset in a uh, historic potash region. It's been mined here for over a hundred years and we're not doing anything particularly new. We've got a massive resource which will support uh, very long life projects. We've got a supportive regional government. We're in a very safe jurisdiction. Uh, we've got an experienced management team who are based in Europe. Uh, 
the market fundamentals are good and we've got close proximity to the markets. So we believe we tick all the boxes. We're hugely undervalued. And I would advise uh, investors, I would encourage investors, take a look at our website, contact me if you have got uh, further queries or Nathan uh, from NWR. And thank you, Nathan, for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Chris. Um, and yeah, just confirming, just clarifying that Chris is in Ireland. That's why it is his morning. It is our afternoon here. Um, we have a question for you around the development of the project. Will you need to bring in, do you think you'll need to bring another company at the project level to help develop the project? Or can you do it um, on your own? We believe we can do it on our own. We are not contemplating joint ventures. At this time, we want to add more value uh, to the projects in the interests of shareholders. Uh, so at this stage, we're going it alone. Uh, we don't see that we're bringing uh, risk into that uh, strategy by uh, developing ourselves. Uh, not only have we got the, the experience in Potash within the company and the track record of project delivery, uh, we also have uh, on board uh, some very uh, top level uh, potash uh, consultants uh, with whom we have a long, uh, long lasting and fruitful relationship. Uh, so we believe we can develop these on our own and uh, we're not uh, at this time, we don't think it's in the shareholders interest uh, to join venture these projects at this time. Given your interests overseas and also the interest overseas in the company, what makes the ASX uh, attractive to, to your, your, the company and why, why stay in Australia? Uh, well, we, we are slowly migrating our base to Europe. We've got European assets and uh, we are slowly but surely becoming a European uh, company. Uh, so whilst we will always remain uh, listed in Australia, uh, because we've got a very strong uh, support base in Australia uh, for which we are very grateful and we would continue to serve uh, the best interests of our Australian shareholders. We would hope going forward to attract uh, European shareholders as well uh, who see the potential in uh, the potential value add uh, in our assets and uh, we would uh, potentially look to seek a dual listing uh, going forward, a dual listing in, in Europe, but not uh, not uh, come walking away from our ASX listing. Great. Thank you, Chris. One last question for you. Uh, it, it might be something you can't answer, it might be too, too granular, granular at this stage, but are you planning to export potash outside Germany? And if yes, from which ports are you planning to ship these goods? That's a good question. Um, Northern European and Northern American producers typically have to export during winter months. Potash sales are seasonal. And so we would, whilst we talk about the European market and we would sell, I would guess 80% of our product into the European market. Uh, there are months, particularly from about October through to January, uh, where uh, European sales are very, very slow. And typically, Northern European and Northern uh, American producers would export a product to places like Brazil, particularly. Um, so I would foresee, uh, we don't have finalized our marketing plan at this stage, but I would foresee at this time that we would export probably somewhere around 200,000 tons uh, per annum. That's about three, three Panamax vessels uh, to Brazil during the winter months. Uh, yeah, and port-wise, likely Hamburg, they've got all the infrastructure there and that would be reasonably close proximity. It would uh, be somewhere around six to eight dollars per ton to rail it to Hamburg and thereafter to uh, Brazil. If you want to export to Brazil, you have to have a different uh, type of potash. You have to have a granular potash. You have to uh, compact the material and make two to four millimeter granules for the Brazilian market. So the the whole process, the, the mine design and the process plant design are actually very strongly market driven. Uh, and that's why we're going to integrate a marketing study into our scoping study from the very beginning. You can't afford to target your market uh, and then design your mine around that target market. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, we might leave it there for today, but of course, if anyone has any questions, uh, there's your email address on the presentation in front of us and also Nathan's from NWR. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thanks, everyone.